Good evening, everyone. Tonight's lecture is, as uh, Nancy said, Dickens and Van Gogh. And I want to just say one thing. Um, I know that one of the people, I have old students, new students, and I do have a member of my family watching tonight, one of my sons, and I'm mentioning him because he keeps a calendar on which he puts all the birthdays of the family and birthdays of people he considers important, like Dickens and Elvis Presley. And I have to tell him that he has to add Van Gogh because March 30th is the birthday of Vincent Van Gogh. And I didn't even know when I scheduled this on the 30th that I was going to give this lecture on Van Gogh's own birthday. So happy birthday, Vincent. So I'd like to begin uh, with some pictures, please. Of uh, this is an early picture of Van Gogh, probably in his 20s or maybe early 30s. And then, of course, one of his self portraits. He did many self portraits. And part of the reason is it was always cheap to do a self portrait, you didn't have to pay a sitter. I like this one, I think it captures his vibrancy. And then his partner in tonight's lecture, Dickens, a photograph of Dickens also. So probably in about his 30s or maybe or early 40s. And then one of the famous paintings of Dickens at that time, the uh, very important relaxed author sitting in his study. So with that as a background, I wanna begin by saying uh, that Van Gogh was a voracious reader. Uh, and long before his development as an artist, Literature and poetry were his first love. There's lots of evidence of his thinking about literature and about uh, poetry in the letters to Theo, his beloved brother. There's so many letters. I want you to look at just one. This is a typical letter of Van Gogh to his brother. He would write and he would sketch uh, on the letter. And this one is of a painting he was thinking of doing. And he had written it, you can see at the bottom of the sketch, uh, the great field should be all violet and the sky and the sun very yellow. So he was always thinking in terms of color. He wrote his brother, I have a more or less irresistible passion for books. I have a need continually to educate myself, to study, just as I need to eat my bread. And in another letter, he said, one must learn to read just as one must learn to see and learn to live. To Vincent van Gogh, reading was an essential part of his life. It was as essential as his painting. And compare them. Reading uses narration. Painting uses perspective. Uh, reading uses character description. Painting uses portraiture. Reading uses a description of setting. Painting uses landscape. Uh, reading uses the text and painting uses texture. So these things were parallel in Vincent's mind. At least 25 of his drawings and paintings contain books or figures reading. The very first uh, figure of a, paint, of a reader that he did was a large and beautiful watercolor. This is called man reading by the fireside. What a wonderful absorption in the book. It's probably very cold and he's keeping warm by a peat fire and reading. All in all, there is a record of his reading about 200 authors in four languages. He was fluent in four languages. Here are some of the authors he read and mentioned in his letters. Dickens, George Eliot, Curra Bell, which was the pseudonym for Char Charlotte Bronte, Carlyle, Zola, Hans Christian Andersen, Bunyan, Defoe, de Maupassant, Dumas, Goethe, Homer, Victor Hugo, Longfellow, Rabelais, Christina Rossetti, Dante, Gabriel Rossetti, Shakespeare, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Tolstoy, Voltaire, Walt Whitman, the Bible. Compare that to the current reading of college students today. It was voluminous. He read both English and French fluently. His reading gave him companionship, diversion, and comfort. 
It formed his choice of subject and his drive towards social realism. And one of his favorites and perhaps the most favorite author of all was Charles Dickens. Reading Dickens influenced him in many ways, even on the level of his brushstroke, which as he matured became bolder and more exaggerated with the years. The quality of the line, bold and heavy, became part of Vincent's method of depicting character and landscape. And compare that to Dickensian characterization, often called exaggeration by mistake. Uh, it's to understand Vincent's approach to portraying individuals. His approach was the same as Dickens used in his novels. He used impasto. It gave his paintings a tactile effect. And he also chose as subjects for his portraiture, uh, those traditionally overlooked, just the way Dickens wrote about the poor, the criminal, and even in Oliver Twist, prostitutes. In his portraits, he captured both the individual and the type. Today, we view him as a modern, but the fact remains that he was insistently, confessedly, and intuitively a Victorian. He was deeply influenced by his youth in England and his lifelong fascination with 19th century British literature. He was a passionate letter writer, as I've already said, and was so fortunate to have oh, hundreds and hundreds of his letters. In an early one, he asked his brother, as to writers, don't you agree? One doesn't really know authors like Dickens, Balzac, Victor Hugo, Zola, until one has more or less full knowledge of their works. And so he always tried to read as much as possible of the full output of his favorite authors. And it is quite probable that he read all of Dickens's novels. What was it that appealed to him so much in Dickens? Well, several themes occur. Injustice sympathy for the poor, the value of simplicity, of humility, of hard work, a celebration of the land, of nature, and most particularly, an examination of the human soul. He loved popular novels. He believed that popular novels struck the note of the 19th century. This is a very important point. He believed that art at its best must be something anyone can comprehend. Of course, it must be thought provoking, but at the same time, it must be simple and immediate. He didn't have a large library. He didn't have a lot of money. And anyway, he wasn't given to keeping books, but his library was stored in his head and he had an amazing memory. He was also attracted by the work of illustrators of his favorite books. He assembled for himself a library of over 2,000 prints, and they all came from the illustrated London News. This was the great age of illustration, especially in England, and all of Dickens's novels were illustrated. He began his practice with his very first book, The Pickwick Papers. And he continued it until his last unfinished work, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. After his death, when he died in 1870, the great age of illustration was over. Nobody did it anymore. And it was an, a, a very, very important part of Dickens's novels. And when you read a Dickens novel, be sure you get an edition which includes the illustrations. And I'm giving you some of the slides of uh, Dickens's illustrations here. This is one from Pickwick. Pickwick was his first big hit. Uh, and of course, perhaps the most thing, uh, important, famous single illustration from all his books came from Oliver Twist. And this is that illustration. It's Oliver daring to come up and ask, please, sir, I want some more. Among all the books precious to Vincent were those of Dickens. And it's clear Dickens was the greatest novelist of the Victorian age. Personally, I think he's the greatest novelist of any age. Uh, he returned to Dickens's books throughout his life. 
Uh, he was drawn to the setting of many of Dickens's novels, the extremely poor districts of London. He read and reread Hard Times. Uh, that was one of his favorites. And he was particularly drawn to the hero of that book, Stephen Blackpool, who was a weaver. And there are many pictures of weavers in the uh, illustrations, in the paintings of Van Gogh. This is an early one. You see the man, uh, weavers worked in their homes, of course. And here is the man working at his loom uh, with the child in some, uh, uh, some sort of high chair on wheels watching him. Um, he thought that Dickens was something of a graphic artist. He said to his brother that he noticed, quote, Dickens himself sometimes used the expression, I have sketched instead of I have written in referring to his novels. Actually, Dickens began his own literary life by ask, being asked to supply text for some hunting scenes, which became in his hands, the Pickwick Papers. Uh, he was hired to just do some, uh, some writing about an illustrator's work and what eventually turned out was his writing was more important to readers than the illustrations. Vincent Lick linked Dickens and the illustrated London news. He read it uh, assiduously. He wrote to his brother, I often felt low in England, but those black and white prints and the novels of Dickens, those are the things that make up for it all. For me, the English draftsman are what Dickens is in the sphere of literature. Vincent was always eager to see all of the new illustrations that were commissioned to accompany Dickens's new or collected editions. He particularly loved, above all, the Christmas books. He wrote to his brother, this week I bought a new six penny edition of Christmas Carol. He loved the Christmas Carol. And I'm going to show you uh, there were originally five illustrations in the Christmas Carol. Of course, uh, it's been so illustrated ever since. This was the first, and it's Fezziwig's Ball. And the second was um, uh, Dickens, uh, Dickens, Scrooge being visited by Jacob Marley uh, with his chains. And the next was the Ghost of Christmas Present, the Jolly Green Giant who takes uh, Scrooge to visit the Cratchits. And of course, one of the most famous of all was the last of the five, uh, Scrooge being brought to his own gravestone by the ghost of Christmas future. Uh, Dickens uh, was his, as I've said many times, Van Gogh's favorite author, but the Christmas Carol was probably his favorite of all. Um, he also liked one of the Christmas books. There were five of them that he that Dickens published over a period of five years, called *The Haunted Man*, which he read and reread. He wrote to his brother, "I find all of Dickens beautiful, but these two tales, *The Christmas Carol* and *The Haunted Man*, I've reread them almost every year since I was a boy, and they always seem new to me." In my mind, there's no other writer who is as much a painter and a draftsman as Dickens. He is one of those writers whose characters are resurrections. Now, I want you to remember that. I'm going to uh, mention it again. His characters are resurrections and what that means. He performed his own resurrection of Dickens in his portraits of the poor, the working class and the overlooked people. He did paintings of peasants, poor mothers, neighbors, anonymous folk. Uh, he didn't do portraits only of the elite, but he liked to do them of the anonymous. He called, I, I think I would call them the first democratic portraits. Here's one of his most famous portraits, the potato eaters. There are several versions of this. Uh, it was an extraordinary subject. These are the poor just at their table after a day's work eating their potatoes. Uh, and as I said, he read the Christmas Carol every year. What did he mean when he said Dickens's characters are resurrections? Well, I think he meant 
that every time he reread something by Dickens, he found new life, new meanings. It's a brilliant way to describe the experience of rereading. I've reread most of the novels I teach, I've reread many times, and each time I read them, I find more and more in them. They're resurrected. And of course, he knew all the five Christmas books. There, are, there were five of them. These, this is my collection. I bought a collection of five of them. I read somewhere that they were very valuable, and I looked up the publication date of mine, and they're not valuable. Well, they're not valuable in a monetary way, but they're valuable uh, to me. These five Christmas books were published in London between 1843, that's Christmas Carol, the first, and 1848. After Dickens's death in 1870, uh, between 1870 and 1879, uh, Chapman and Hall, his main publisher, published a household edition of all Dickens's works, 22 volumes, with new illustrations. And Vincent mentioned this in his letters several times. It's clear that he not only read the originals of the novels, but he followed the various editions with great interest because you can see the evolution of the mood of the illustrator uh, in the subsequent editions. Just before his death in 1870, uh, Dickens was writing The Mystery of Edwin Drood. And here is one of the illustrations from that. And you can see it's become somewhat more modernized than the early uh, illustrations of Pickwick. Uh, this is one of the pictures from The Mystery of Edwin Drood. This was done by uh, Luke Fieldus. Uh, Fieldus was a social realist. He had done many paintings of the current misery of the poor in 19th century England. One of his most popular works is this one. Uh, it's called Applicants for Admission to a Casual Ward. These are people standing around the street. They're sick, they have sick children, and they're waiting to see if they can get into what, is, what was called at the time, I guess we'd call it a walk-in clinic, but they called it a casual ward. When this painting was exhibited at the National Gallery, it was, an exhibit, it was exhibited together with a letter by Charles Dickens, who described the painting in passionate words. Dumb, wet, silent horrors, sphinxes set up against that dead wall and none likely to be solved until the general overthrow. And the letter was displayed along with the painting. This painting was so popular that they had to install a special railing to keep the crowds back who wanted to see this painting of a queue of homeless people waiting either for medical attention or an overnight shelter on a cold winter's night. There were other paintings uh, that uh, Dickens uh, liked. Uh, this one was a painting of a, a third class waiting room people sitting around waiting to get on a, on, a, on a train perhaps or a bus. Another one uh, that Dickens uh, mentions uh, and Van Gogh mentions, this is called um, The Last Muster. This is a, a bunch of people, old soldiers who have uh, come up for the last muster. And in the middle, you'll see uh, an elderly man taking the pulse of his uh, fellow next to him who has just died. These paintings are mentioned by Van Gogh in his letters. He, he was very uh, uh, taken by paintings of the sufferings of the poor. And he said later to his brother, I have always remembered those English pictures. Um, when Fieldus, the illustrator of uh, Edwin Drood, uh, he came, he visited Dickens at Gads Hill. Gads Hill was an estate that Dickens had bought and he lived there, uh, he died there actually, it was his estate during uh, the last years of his life. And they were working on Edwin Drood together. And Phil, this, uh, the story goes, uh, he entered the study where he was to meet Dickens and he went in and he found only an empty chair. This struck him so, because he found out of course that Dickens had died and so he wasn't available in the study. And he composed a painting that would become one of the most famous paintings of the 19th century, 
and it was called The Empty Chair. And that's Dickens's desk. He always had special things on his desk uh, that he, he had to have them there in order for him to write. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he wrote only in his study and he used to enter it at nine in the morning and, and leave it at one o'clock. And then he had lunch and then he would visit friends or take a walk and at dinner after that. But he had those hours in his study every day. He went in there every day of his life. And someone once asked him, well, what do you do if you go into your study and you can't think of anything? And his answer was, I sit there just the same. So this is Fielder's famous painting called The Empty Chair. It was then printed in the graphic as a, as a print uh, for Christmas of 1870. This story of the empty chair, which of course got around, was a trigger to the vision of Vincent van Gogh. Two paintings resulted. He did two famous paintings of empty chairs. This first one is his own chair. And you see, it's a very simple chair with a sort of rattan uh, base. And uh, he had invited his friend Gauguin to live with him for a while, it didn't work out anyway, but he then painted uh, Gauguin's chair. It's a much more elegant chair. Uh, it has books on it, it has a candle. There's all kinds of critical uh, speculations about what these chairs mean, but each can be read as a kind of portrait. As Dickens's was also the empty chair in his study uh, Vincent's empty chair, Gauguin's empty chair. Um, they were, uh, uh, they can be seen, some critics say, it's a symbol of the mortality of the artist. I mean, the artist is gone, he's dead. I don't know about that. Uh, I don't know what Vincent thought when he painted them or whether he, and I'm sure he was thinking of the painting of the empty chair by Fildes. He gave both these paintings, Vincent gave both these paintings to his brother, Theo, because he said he didn't think they would ever be appreciated by a wider audience. <clears throat> I mean, who would buy a painting of a chair? <clears throat> he could not have imagined that one of them, his own empty chair, would be the first of his works to enter a public collection in Britain where it now belongs to the National Gallery in Trafalgar Square, just a few minutes walk from the street where much earlier Vincent had worked as an art dealer. Uh, and uh, you probably all know, uh, Vincent sold only one of his paintings in his lifetime. His uh, Van Gogh's chair and Gauguin's chair epitomized the artist's interest in Dickens and his illustrators. Uh, <clears throat> It was uh, Millet, uh, Dickens uh, had a friend, an artist friend, Millet, who had encouraged Dickens to commission Fildes to illustrate uh, Edwin Drood. And he had done so because he was so impressed by those uh, paintings uh, that I've already showed you. And uh, 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 he, told, uh, he told his brother, uh, I, I, I can see in my imagination Millet running to Charles Dickens with the first issue of the graphic. Um, Millet said to Dickens, we are told, give him your Edwin Drew to illustrate. And it was Dickens's last work. And Fildes was brought into contact with Dickens through those illustrations. <clears throat> well, uh, as I told you, the empty chair became one of the most uh, popular and uh, memorable images published by the graphic. Van Gogh read Edwin Drood in June 1882 <clears throat> when he was bedridden. This is a print of the, the prints uh, circulated everywhere of the Fildes painting. Uh, uh, Van Gogh read Edwin Drood when he was bedridden and suffering from gonorrhea. He wrote to his brother, I have a few volumes of Dickens, including Edwin Drood. Good God, what an artist. There's no one like him. And as soon as he got out of the hospital, he bought a copy of the Fieldist print of Dickens's empty chair. And he later on went on to talk about the mortality of artists. He said to his brother, sooner or later, there will be nothing but empty chairs in the place of all of us. Um, so these paintings, I think, pay homage 
to these important sources of inspiration. Here are three paintings of readers in the work of Van Gogh. Uh, there's a lot, if you look at, into his uh, work, and he painted many, many pictures, uh, many paintings. This one is of a garden in Paris with a man standing and reading a newspaper. Entrance to the public garden, excuse me, it's in Arles. It's not in Paris, it's in Arles. The second is uh, uh, Lucius de Roman, a woman sitting in a library reading. And the last is quite a famous painting that you probably will all recognize, Lali Zen. He did many versions of this painting. Um, this one I'd like to stop over for just a minute. What's important about this one is that you can see, you can't see on this because we're, it's been reproduced and I'm showing it to you on a slide, but you can read the titles of the two books that the woman is reading. One of them is Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, a book that he liked very much. And the other is Dickens's A Christmas Carol. Okay, and I think I had another one yet. This is another one. They're so different, uh, but the same two books are there, almost as if they are his inspiration. Uh, he often read, uh, he liked to read prefaces that authors wrote to their books. This is something that's gone out. We don't do this so much anymore. When you get a book, usually there'll be an introduction by some famous critic. But in the 19th century, authors often wrote their own prefaces to their novels. And uh, Vincent loved to read them. He said, I like to read the prefaces because there I can learn about the artist's intentions. I seek in them the artist who makes them. And one of the prefaces that I want to talk to you about very briefly, it's a very important one, was to the uh, a newly published novel by de Maupassant. And he wrote to his brother, have you read the de Maupassant preface explaining the freedom the artist has to exaggerate, to create in a novel a more beautiful, simpler, consoling nature? Uh, and he noticed that de Maupassant described how one should examine a subject. And this is a very important quote. Quote, to describe a fire that flames and a tree in a field, we must remain still facing that fire and that tree until they no longer resemble any other tree or any other fire. We must look on what we wish to express long enough and with enough attention to discover some aspect that has never been seen or portrayed by another. The least thing contains something of the unknown. Let us find it. I love that quote quotation because he says, you know, I keep looking at that tree until it becomes in a sense my tree. It's not the tree that's out there anymore. And if you look at the paintings of Vincent, of his many trees and his many flowers, they're not the exact tree, but they are uh, the tree that he wants to express and that he has seen something in it that has never been seen before or portrayed by any other. And I think that's what Dickens did with his characters and his novels. He looks at them and he thinks of them and he talks of them long enough until they become his own. They're not like anything else. Uh, I think that's a very important quote. The least thing contains something of the unknown. Let us find it. You know, I've done a lot of painting just for fun. And my paintings always look exactly like what I'm painting. <laughs> that's because I'm not Van Gogh. Uh, so that's an important quote. Uh, Dickens is always accused of exaggeration. That's just a, a constant in criticism of Dickens. E.M. Forster one, uh, wrote a very, a, a very brilliant and small, brilliant book about the novel called Aspects of the Novel. And he divides characters in the novel into flat characters and round characters. And, you know, he, he says, you know, flat characters, they're always the same. And round characters are always changing. 
And everybody stops reading it right after that. And they lump Dickens, they say, oh, well, he just did flat characters. They never change, you know? Think about David Copperfield, Mrs. Micawber is always saying, I never will desert Mr. Micawber. And she never does, you know? So that some people have picked that division into flat and round characters and made it into a criticism of Dickens, but they don't finish the quote. The Forster wrote, Dickens's people are nearly all flat, nearly all flat. Nearly every one can be summed up in a sentence. But this is an important contribution to literature. Part of the genius of Dickens is that he does use types and caricatures, people whom we recognize the instant they enter and re-enter, and yet he achieves effects that are not mechanical and a vision of humanity that is not shallow. So I think Dickens found what Van Gogh liked in that de Maupassant preface, the least thing contains something of the unknown, let us find it. Well, Van Gogh continued to the end of his life to spend hours reading and rereading the works of his favorite authors, especially Dickens's Christmas tales. He also read and reread Shakespeare. He was a great fan of Shakespeare. Well, at one point he talked about King Lear and he loved the loyal Kent so stubbornly devoted to Lear, such a noble and distinguished character. He was always certain he would find new meaning between the lines of an old book. And again, in that painting uh, that I already showed you, he did so many paintings of this same woman sitting at the table, reading the books, and each one is different because each time he discovers something different. Um, he, uh, of course, uh, ended his life in a sanitarium uh, at St. Remé, and he said uh, he loved to read uh, Dickens's Christmas Carol and Uncle Tom's Cabin because he found in them, and this is a quote, positivity and humanitarian sentiments. It's very important to find positivity in what we read. I sometimes think about a lot of the books that I read described in the Sunday book review of the New York Times. And uh, I wonder, do they have positivity? It seems like many do not. Van Gogh wanted to find that. Uh, and in these two works, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is tragic, I mean, it's about slavery but he found positivity in it. And in the Christmas Carol, there are, you know, the children, ignorance and want, there is suffering, there's suffering in Oliver Trist, but there's positivity in the books. He said, in these two works, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin and in the Christmas Carol, he found the ethical and political potential of literary art, political potential. Uh, these works had political potential. And I think when Van Gogh did the paintings of the poor, the potato eaters, the weavers, uh, uh, the downtrodden of society, uh, he was also finding something uh, not only negative, but positivity. Well, as I've said, he read uh, uh, most of his novels uh, in English and in French. And the ones he specifically mentions of Dickens are Pickwick, Oliver Twist, Christmas Carol, Christmas Books, Tale of Two Cities, Hard Times, Little Dorrit, and The Mystery of Edwin Drood. He also loved Jane Eyre, Middlemarch, Felix Holt, The Radical, that's a George Eliot book, Silas Marner, and he loved Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. That's not a surprise. Um, he went so far as to title some of his drawings in English. He wrote to his brother, for me, the English black and white artists are to art what Dickens is to literature. They have the same sentiment, noble and healthy. One always returns to them. I love that. One always returns to them. You can never read a good book, a masterpiece once. You've got to read it more, more than once to find all that is in it. And Dickens, uh, uh, Van Gogh concluded this letter, I am organizing my whole life so as to do the things of everyday life that Dickens describes and the artists I have mentioned have drawn. 
Well, to sum it all up, as we've seen, Van Gogh greatly admired the illustrations of Dickens's novels and not only the illustrations, but the novels themselves. We see the importance of the empty chair uh, and of the book, the other paintings that Van Gogh uh, admired. Uh, he regarded his life, Vincent, as a journey. Initially in religious terms, he went through a period when he thought he would be a minister. And after he finally rejected Christianity, he turned to art as his religion. And he, he, he came to see the writings of authors like Harriet Beecher Stowe, George Eliot, whom he also loved, and particularly Dickens as modern equivalents of the gospels. I told you that he liked prefaces. Well, uh, he liked the preface to Little Dorrit. Little Dorrit is one of Dickens's last novels. Uh, and uh, he said, uh, uh, I'd like you just to read a little bit from that preface so you can see what he liked about it. Here's what Dickens wrote. Dickens wrote in the preface. I was occupied writing this story during many working hours of two years. It often took Dickens two years and sometimes three to write one of his novels. I must have been very ill-employed if I could not leave its merits and demerits as a whole to express themselves on its being read as a whole. If I might offer any apology for so exaggerated a fiction, oh, this is my spam call coming in. Let me move the phone. It's a, an aspect of modern life, spam calls. So let me go back. Uh, Dickens knew that he was accused of exaggeration. So he continues in this preface. If I might offer any apology for so exaggerated a fiction as the circumlocution office. I love that title. That is one of the most brilliant names he gave to modern bureaucracy, the circumlocution officer. Don't you love the phone calls you get that begin your call is important to us. And then you go right into the circumlocution office. It was a brilliant uh, uh, a title for a place in which bureaucracy, bureaucracy gets nothing done. So Dickens writes in his preface, if I might offer any apology for so exaggerated a fiction as the circumlocution office, I would seek it in the common experience of an Englishman if I might make so bold as to defend that extravagant conception, Mr. Myrtle, Mr. Myrtle is one of the bureaucrats, I would hint that it originated after the railroad share epic in the times of a certain Irish bank failure and one or two other equal laudable enterprises. By the way, there are bank failures, speaking of the contemporary <laughs> feeling of Dickens in Little Jarrett, and nobody gets their money out because all they can get is the circumlocution office, which refers them to the next person. And Dickens ends his preface by saying, I submit myself to suffer judgment on all these count, accounts, if on all these counts, if need be, and to accept the assurance that nothing like them was ever known in this land. Very, very withering sarcasm. Van Gogh found relief in Dickens's depth his viewpoint. Uh, he remarked even on the use of perspective in Dickens. What he meant was that Dickens had the knack of presenting a subject in different lights. Uh, and I'm going to end with a passage from David Copperfield. This is a passage uh, which I think represents something of what Van Gogh liked about Dickens. And we're going to put the passage up. It's very short. When I came, this is uh, David goes to the theater one night and he then after seeing the play he comes out into the street and this is the passage when i came out into the rainy street at 12 o'clock at night i felt as if i had come from the clouds where i had been leading a romantic life for ages to a bawling splashing link lighted umbrella struggling hackney coach jostling patent clinking, muddy, miserable world. I had emerged by another door 
and stood in the street for a little while as if I really were a stranger upon earth. Um, so we see David has seen this play and, and he's uh, has been transported uh, into another world uh, by the artist and then he has to come back to reality. I think both Dickens and Van Gogh were sensitive souls, each in their own way, trying to adapt to and render the reality of an imperfect world. Look at that imperfect world. Of course, Dickens will give you 10 adjectives. Who cares? He'll give them, give them all to you. Falling, that sound, splashing, the rain, link lighted. Obviously, there are street lights. Umbrella struggling. People are, you know, it, he puts it all into a short phrase. Hackney coach jostling. Patent clinking, more sound, that's the patents on the cobblestone. Muddy, miserable world. And, uh, and, and he feels when he comes out into this world, having been in the world of the theater, a stranger upon the earth. I think one of the things that amazed Van Gogh about Dickens uh, was that he had written a very critical vision of Victorian England while at the same time being applauded by it. Uh, his work, Dickens' work, relied upon a feeling of rebellion towards everything that represented authority. And Van Gogh saw this as man's destiny, a path to follow, an ideal of will and struggle. And I wanted to end here with these two late portraits of the two authors. Um, on the left, of course, Van Gogh with his bandaged ear uh, uh, in uh, the very last uh, year of his life. And this is a painting of Dickens, probably also toward the end of his life. Um, so uh, I, I want to uh, end there and would like to open it up to any questions or comments uh, that you might have. I wonder if anyone had ever before this thought about the link between these two, uh, the painter and the writer. There's a comment in the chat that says not important, but only if you need questions. Um, wondering if Van Gogh's chair and the art might have influenced the writer of Les Mis music in that sad song, Empty Chairs at Empty Tables, where our oh. friends will sit no more. Oh, interesting, yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. I mean, just who, who before Van Gogh uh, would have thought of making a portrait of a person through one object like a chair? I mean, and I do think he got it from the Fieldus illustration. Especially Dr. Heinemann, it's Kathleen. Um, especially um, the influencer influencing others all down the line, and the lack of presence is so. You know, the empty chair is an empty chair, but the you never forget the person who sat in it. Yes, that's good. Yes, um, uh, it's just a unique. I don't know any other artists. I, I I don't have a vast knowledge of art. Uh, who would have dared to do that painting? And, and of course, he 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 gives these paintings to his brother because he says, "I can never sell them," <laughs> which is ironic. Yes, never knew he read English. Yes, he read English. He read French. Uh, he read uh, Dutch, obviously also, um, and he read German. How would Vincent? Can I see that question? How would Vincent be able to? There's, there's a there's a comment that's next. I'm a huge Van Gogh fan. This is Chris. And I'm especially interested in all those who influenced him. I have his diaries and I know that he and Dickens both sought to bring light to the plight of the poor. That's a comment. Yeah, and and, um, and, and Van, by the way, Van Gogh's favorite artist was Millet, uh, who also uh, depicted the, the peasants working in the field for him, for Millet. That was the authentic life. Yeah, another comment? 
Sheila says, never knew that Van Gogh was such a reader. Never, never knew he read in English. Yes, yes. Well, you know, I mean, it's, it's incredible how much he read. And I think about, uh, sometimes I think about these things and I shouldn't, but they tell you about uh, the kids today uh, are spending four and five hours a day uh, gaming or going on TikTok or whatever they do. Um, and they, they're not reading, uh, they're probably reading their assignments, but um, reading is, is so very important. It was so very important. Uh, and Dickens is the most visual of writers. Do you know that more movies, television uh, uh, shows and whatnot have been made of Dickens novels than any other writer in any language? I think it's something like 350 or maybe even 400 films, um, movies, uh, there's one right now, you know, they have great expectations they put on Hulu. There's a new one. And of course, I took a month of Hulu so that I could watch it. And uh, I won't say what I think about it, but it's obviously great expectations gave rise, you know, to so many uh, 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 versions of it. Uh, there's, uh, think of how many versions there are of the Christmas Carol going right down to the Muppets. Uh, and uh, uh, the one Scrooged, uh, there's just no end to the way Dickens gave inspiration through his books visually to people to put it into visual terms. Yes, there's another comment. There's another comment. How would Vincent, or question, how would Vincent be able to afford access to books? There weren't public libraries yet, were there? No, no. Uh, and I, I did say he didn't have a lot of books. He got them. Uh, you, there were lending libraries. Uh, lending libraries had begun in the Victorian period. And um, obviously his brother sent him money uh, to buy the, he, he lived on the Illustrated London News. He, 2000 prints, he had his own collection of them. Uh, so uh, he spent whatever he had what his brother sent him. He could go to lending libraries. Um, I, I don't know whether he borrowed books from anyone. He did not have the books. He didn't have the, uh, a, a library of books. You know, uh, He didn't need to keep them. He said at one point, my library is in my mind. I, I can always get, he had a tremendous memory. You know, it's probably better when things are scarce than we, we treasure them more. Yes, another question. Um, Janet said, Van Gogh painted a series of paintings after Millet saw a wonderful exhibit of them years ago. Yes. Um, and then um, another yes. comment. And they all began with those roofed, rooftops of London. And then the last question was, who painted the portrait of Dickens in the last slide? McLeese, his friend McLeese, Daniel McLeese. And that portrait, I, I have a great story. It was owned, it is owned by the Victoria and Albert Museum. And I took a trip over there one time. And I want, the one thing I wanted to see was that portrait. I mean, that was it for me. And so I went to the Victoria and Albert and I'm looking for the 19th century section. And this, they tell me, all of a sudden they say, it's closed today for renovation. And um, I was so upset. I didn't quite throw a tantrum, but I said, oh my God, you know, I've come from America and I, why can't I? And she said, well, I'll, I'll walk you through it and we'll see if we can find it. So this very nice uh, uh, lady uh, walked me through the Victorian section and we walked through the whole thing and there was no portrait of Dickens. And I said, but I know it's here. She said, well, let me ask. So she asked somebody and they said, it's going to Japan. There's an exhibit in Japan and that painting is going there and they're just getting it ready. And I said, oh, please, could I see it? And so I guess I had made enough trouble. They took me into this room. I will never forget it. There was a woman with white gloves on, you know, and the painting was on a table and she was 
getting ready to pack it to send it to Japan. And they gave me some time along with it. So it was just a great, <laughs> it was wonderful because I was right up close to it, you know, and it is a wonderful painting and very, very much uh, uh, one expressing uh, Dickens at the height, at the height of his, his own life. I mean, his own life began, these two artists, both of them had very, very sad endings. Van Gogh, of course, wound up in this sanitarium and uh, they say, he's supposed to have shot himself. I do not believe it. There is a biography of Van Gogh, a huge biography by two men. I'm going, cannot tell you their names right now, but you could find it. And they, they have, first of all, no gun was ever found. And his, his easel, that he always brought an easel out when he painted outside, it was gone. And uh, uh, so how did he shoot himself? And these two men posited that he had been teased by a bunch of teenagers in the area and they, they made fun of him and so forth. I'm sure he looked, you know, had this bandage over his ears and whatnot and that they were teasing him and they had a gun and that it was an accidentally they shot him. I believe that story. I do not believe he shot himself. But anyway, that's just a sidelight. So he wound up, uh, uh, then he, it took him about three, three days, I think, to die and uh, a very, very sad ending to the life of a brilliant artist. And of course, Dickens, uh, who had been a family man, um, 10 children, his wife bore him and uh, he uh, fell in love with a young actress at 18 and uh, uh, messed up his life uh, sort of kicked his wife out of his house. Well, he, it's not quite clear. Uh, he wanted her to stay in the house uh, and sort of put up a facade to society that he was still living uh, with her uh, and she wouldn't do it. And so she, he, she had to leave then. And he put her up in a house someplace. And, and he had this young actress, uh, I think probably as his mistress. And she never, she never loved him. Of course not. Uh, he was old and sick. Uh, he was lame. Uh, he was a great walker and he had a lame foot. And, but he was rich and he was famous. And uh, so both of them for, in different ways uh, uh, wound up uh, not happily. Uh, I don't know whether that's a, a good way to end this lecture, but uh, each of them a genius. I think Van Gogh, one of the great painters, uh, of the 19th century and the 20th. People, you go into the museum of uh, the MFA and walk up into that uh, 19th century section and you will never find a Van Gogh painting without someone looking at it. Uh, and Dickens, I think, uh, I don't think there's a better novelist. You, you have to invest in an 800 or 900 page book uh, to, to get the full force of it. But I think they were both geniuses in their own right. Okay, anything else? Well, thank you for uh, joining me on this uh, uh, visit to uh, uh, two great artists and uh, the appreciation that Van Gogh had uh, of Dickens and of, the, of exaggeration, um, of seeing something that no one had ever seen in these works. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Thank Heineman. you, thank, thank you, Dr. Heineman. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To thank reading you. Villette. <laughs> We're reading Villette. In, That's right. I came in late, but I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> <laughs>